Real options. Real options are capital budgeting options that allow managers to make decisions in the future that alter the value of capital budgeting investment decisions made today. This sounds like a mouthful, but we'll go through some examples which will make this clear. In some ways, they are similar to financial options because as with financial options, real options are contingent on future events. If you think about a call option on a stock, the value of the call option is contingent on the value of the underlying stock. Similarly, real options are contingent on some underlying asset. The distinction is that with real assets, the underlying asset is a real asset as opposed to a financial asset. So there are several different types of real options and we will talk about them at a high level. Then the curriculum has several good examples and we will look at some of those examples. One option is a timing option where if you are doing a project where you have the option to wait for say six months in order to gather more information and make a more informed decision as to whether or not to spend money on a large plant. Is that option to wait valuable? The answer is yes. So point is you are here at point zero. This is time t. So if you have the option to wait till time t and then start your project over here, that is valuable because it gives you the option to collect information and decide whether or not to engage in this project. At times you might not have this option because if you wait then the competitor might build the plant. But if you can do something, spend some money, buy a license or buy something, spending that money is like buying an option. And what is the benefit of that option that you can now wait for six months. So this is called a timing option. Another is a sizing option. There are different types of sizing options, growth and expansion option. So let's say you build a factory. When you build the factory, you don't know what the eventual demand will be like. So if you believe that it is possible that the demand will be very high, so high that your current factory will not be able to fulfill this demand. So you spend some money and buy the land right next to it, but don't build on it. The purchase of this land is like buying an option where if the demand takes off, then you can exercise the option and exercising the option would be building a factory on this adjacent land. So this is a growth and expansion option. Another related option which is used quite often is an abandonment option. Say you are in the distribution business. You get your input from a supplier and then you sell. And in your business, you need to sign 10 year contracts. So you are in a 10 year contract to buy a given commodity. And then it turns out after two years that the commodity price has changed so that it is no more feasible for you to stay in this line of work. If you are locked in with a 10 year contract, then you have a problem because you need to keep engaging in this not so profitable business. But if at the time of signing the contract, you put in an abandonment option where you might have had to pay something for that abandonment option, but that gives you the option of ending the contract if necessary and avoiding a loss making scenario. That is another example of embedding an option into your real contract. You can also have flexibility options, which include price setting options, flexibility. So maybe your contract with your customer can be such where you have the flexibility to increase prices. Production flexibility, you might spend an extra amount of money on your plant so that you have the flexibility to build more kinds of products. You can set up arrangements with suppliers so that if you are not being supplied by one supplier, you can go to other suppliers. So in the way you make things, you can set things up so that you have multiple options. So note that the use of options over here is a lot like the use of options in regular English. And smart managers, when they do projects, they try to have options that allow them 
to make changes in the project at a later point in time once the project has already started. There are some projects which are entirely options unto themselves. For example, if you think about drilling for oil and gas, clearly there will be a certain amount of cost associated with drilling. Clearly there is a certain probability of finding oil and gas. Those who are familiar with the business know that when you drill for oil and gas, there is no guarantee that you will get oil and gas. There is a certain probability and you need to spend a fair amount of money before you know what you are getting. So, on what basis do you start drilling, given the cost and given the given that there is a finite probability of finding something? Clearly, the feasibility of drilling or not drilling depends on the market price of oil and gas or market price of whatever it is that you are drilling for. So, it will be feasible to drill if the market price is above a certain level. In that scenario, the whole project is an option. So you, when you have drilling rights, in a sense, buying those drilling rights is like buying an option where the underlying is the market value of whatever you are drilling for, right? So if you think about it, the concept of real options shows up in many different scenarios. How do you evaluate and analyze real options? The curriculum doesn't get into too much detail, but gives you some common sense approaches. One is to use discounted cash flow analysis without considering options. And what this is saying is, if without considering an option, you do an NPV analysis of a project, and the NPV is positive, then you just go for it. Because if you are doing a project where the NPV is positive, and there are some options that are embedded in the project, the options can only add value. So if, the NP, so if the NPV is positive, just go for it. What if you have a situation where the NPV without considering the option is negative? Then what you do is the following. You look at the NPV based on discounted cash flow alone. And let's say that this is some negative number. Okay, so say this is negative 50. But the project has some embedded options and you can actually pay a certain amount of money for that embedded option. Say that you pay five for an embedded option, but the value of that option then is 70. By having that option, the NPV increases by 70. Then it makes sense to get this option or it makes sense to spend money on the option because by having this option, your project then becomes a positive NPV project. And we'll see an example of this shortly. Decision trees, the curriculum doesn't spend much time on this, but you can actually have the concept of decision trees. And since the curriculum doesn't spend much time on this, I'll not cover this particular concept. In finance textbooks that deal with real options, this can be covered in a fair amount of detail. But all this would ultimately be based on probabilities and time value of money. And finally, you can use option pricing models such as Black-Scholes or the binomial pricing model. And again, that's not covered over here.